Why don't we once again begin with prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and loving Lord, we give you thanks for your gift of creating us and the very gift of creation itself, which expresses something of your beauty, something of your glory in heaven. And as we ponder the great gift of art, the gift of beauty, and how our church buildings and liturgy itself is meant to express something of your heavenly majesty, help us to open our minds and hearts to renewed understanding of the truth of beauty and the truth of your perfect beauty in heaven. And may we be inspired this night to truly recognize how you are at work in all who do art in your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, hopefully tonight will be more fun because we get to look at pictures, <laughs> at least for part of our time. Um, admitting that my title is a little bit of a misnomer, Art and Architecture in the Liturgy, what I do want to accomplish tonight is a little bit of a sense of why do these things even matter? Um, and, and to enter a little bit more deeply into how sacred space truly does lend itself to our being able to enter into a deeper encounter with God and really how it's meant to do that. And I think that's really the the key thing here is how in our Catholic faith material things truly do help us enter into a deeper encounter with God who though he is pure spirit, though he is invisible wills to take on our human flesh and furthermore willed to make himself present to us in the particular graces of the seven sacraments material realities that those be, at least most of them, in a very direct way, being material realities. So in order to kind of get into this, it's important that we have our definitions of sacraments and sacramental clear. And for those who are the, the journey people and have been here faithfully each time, this is something we've tread upon before, but if there's any first-timers, um, know that one of the things that I did in, in an earlier week, not that you had to be here for this, which is why it's in your outline, is talked a little bit about what the sacraments are and for that matter what sacramentals are. So in the catechism, sacraments are defined as efficacious signs of grace instituted by Christ entrusted to the church by which divine life is dispensed to us and in the visible rites of the sacraments they make present the grace of God that is signified by them and so what that means in essence is that God willingly through the material signs of say water in baptism or oil in the anointing of the sick, or confirmation for that matter, through these visible signs, he makes present and truly effective his own divine life given according to the purpose of the sacrament. So again, baptism for the forgiveness of sin and entrance into Christ's body, becoming a member, anointing of the sick as grace to be strong and persevering in time of illness, uniting one's suffering with Jesus' own suffering that's redemptive and thus not pointless, etc. All of this is predicated on the fact that God, through material things, indeed is able to communicate to us, but more so, he as the author of creation truly has the power to endow these things with that grace. Whereas when we talk about what are the sacramentals, they are, so to speak, 
like the sacraments insofar as they have this material, tangible reality to it, but whereas the sacraments get their power directly from Jesus Christ, sacramentals are established by the church, and they help us, in a sense, to be better disposed to receive the sacraments. Art, architecture, would fit into this category of being sacramentals in addition to such things as statues, holy water, rosaries, scapulars, etc., etc. And so tonight we are talking about, again, material things, but with a little different twist than what we have tread upon when we talk, say, about the sacraments. And while we're aware of the seven sacraments per se, recognize this example that all of you, I assume, somewhere in your house have at least some pictures of whether it's yourself or your family or your children or your parents or whomever. Are those pictures your children or are those pictures your parents or are they just paper and ink? They're just paper and ink, right? But when you look at them, you are reminded of those who are imaged or pictured by that paper and ink, right? And so this is the kind of character of what we will be talking about tonight in terms of how, where we worship, what it looks like, helps us to more deeply, more properly encounter God. And I have to admit, tonight is kind of a, a plethora I've been joking with a few people that we're going to cover all of this in the time that we have tonight. This is just, this is the binder of materials that was given out over a, a three-week summer intensive course where I basically learned most of what I know about these matters, albeit I had a second course related to some of tonight's outline as well which I left those notes upstairs, but it wasn't nearly as thick as this. Um, but we could have gone a lot of directions tonight, but because I've been promising for pretty much every Tuesday night since we've been doing this, that I was going to talk about some of the very interesting and I would say kind of exciting characteristics of our church here, um, it, it kind of caused me to have to take a, a little bit more kind of purposeful track to get to that point so that some of the things that I learned in times past about styles of architecture, et cetera, et cetera, what different things mean, what they have meant, we're going to leave that to further study. And in fact, if time allows, well, it, it will allow because it's in one of my PowerPoint slides for tonight. I'll introduce you to a, a set of short videos that my own professor has done on these matters so that if you want to on your own time and your etc learn more you can uh, queue up those little approximately five minute each videos and hear it straight from the guy who taught me what I'm telling you for the most part um, so Again, we want, to, we want to recognize God is able to communicate himself through the, the visible things. So to jump right in with both feet then, let's talk about what beauty is. And we all know the expression, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. <laughs> um, and, and perhaps that's an expression that we have accepted with good faith, beauty in the eye of the beholder. But when it comes to what we're talking about tonight, there has to be something more. And you'll recognize this, I hope, without me even giving any sort of theological argument. How many of you have ever been to a, a mass on a Sunday in another town and looked for a church and driven up to the church and there's the sign, St. Peter's or St. John's or St. James's church and you look and you say, 
that doesn't look like a church. How many of you have been there? Amen. Is beauty really in the eye of the beholder, in the mind of the church? Not really. And it's predicated on the fact that beauty and truth are truly in harmony with one another. And one of my sources for you tonight will be St. Thomas Aquinas, who for his part didn't necessarily write anything directly about beauty, but he does talk about what we call the transcendentals, the true, the good, and the beautiful. And so from him we sort of glean some principles as to where we can say that beauty is not merely something that what, what's beautiful for me is for me and what's beautiful for any of you is beautiful for you but that it does have an objective standard. And it may surprise you kind of how beauty will be defined then because things that may not be, so to speak, pretty or sort of pleasant to us at times can and at times are, in St. Thomas's perspective here, beautiful. And so, to get to that point, of a little bit of definition game here. One of the things we talk about you know, when we're talking about any of these kinds of matters of beauty is the whole realm of aesthetics. And aesthetics are basically to perceive with the senses. So this doesn't simply refer to the attractiveness or prettiness of a thing but rather it refers more to the action, the activity of the person taking in what is seen, what is heard, what is smelled, and making a judgment accordingly. So when we say things are, you know, when we talk about aesthetics, we're certainly talking about the realm of things that are beautiful, but we want to kind of wind it back from there and without getting right to the well, things that are aesthetically pleasing, et cetera, et cetera. No, we want to talk about the, the, the judgment piece of that, that we have to be able to perceive something first. And in this way, if we're going to talk about what's beautiful, the first thing that has to be in place is that the thing has to exist. Because if it can't be perceived, because it doesn't exist, and it's just merely a theory, how can we really say it's beautiful? But once something exists and becomes in some way tangible where we can perceive it, then we can judge whether or not it's beautiful. And beauty in this context, to quote, it says, beauty is the radiance of being in all of its transcendental aspects together. Okay, so that probably means nothing to most of us here. Said another way, beauty is the revealing of the perfection of that which is called beautiful. Okay, that probably still doesn't mean very much, but at least that's hopefully tapping into it a little bit. If something is beautiful, it points to what it really is in a very, might we say, awe-inspiring or proper way. So to go back to an example here. I have a book, and here's a commercial. It's the book of this same professor that I've been referring to in, in uh, sort of carnage, as it were, but not by name just yet. His name is Dr. Dennis McNamara. This is basically his book, which I believe is an attempt to condense all of this into this. So, um, this didn't exist at the time that he was teaching the course to me and my colleagues back in 2005, I think it was, was our summer session that year when we had Dr. McNamara for these matters. But albeit, I have this book. We perceive that it's a book. You know, it's, it's a hardcover book, which some, myself included, would argue is higher quality than a paperback book. Um, does it look like a book? Does it function like a book? Sure. It has a certain character about it, identity to it, that is clearly revealed. 
Now, if I were to say this is a, oh, I don't know, sausage and mushroom pizza, I tell you, this would not be a very beautiful sausage and mus mushroom pizza because, it, first of all, it doesn't look like one as we're accustomed to seeing a sausage and mushroom pizza. I'm certainly not going to try and eat this to see if it tastes like one. But you see, if this were objectively a pizza, it would be a pretty ugly pizza. But as a book, we could say it has a quality of beauty to it, right? So far, so good. It's kind of a, perhaps a little bit of a trite example. It'll make more sense when we start talking more about the actual church building. Um, because as I get down into the Aquinas allusions here, St. Thomas, he says that things are called beautiful upon being seen. So again, that something exists points to the fact that in itself that it exists is a beautiful part of it. Beauty is the perfection of being. For a thing to have beauty, it must really exist. A thing is beautiful when, and this is the important part, when it's invisible reality. The fact that this is a book. When that is most effectively revealed. So, if this thing was in tatters, let's say, and it didn't necessarily reveal bookness, if you would. It wouldn't be as beautiful as this one is, which, frankly, I've only had for, I don't even think it's been a full year. And, honestly, I've only had to refer to a couple times so far. Um, even though I probably do well to read the whole thing cover to cover one of these uh, weeks or months. But it's in excellent condition still. And so its bookness is quite clear. As a book, it, we might say, well, it's kind of an ugly book because it's so big and it's going to be bulky and hard to hold for a long time. But hey, look, it's got pictures in it. <laughs> so, oh, so this book is more than just narrative. It actually involves a certain sense of being able to perceive and, and look at examples so that in itself already gives more clarity to the book, but it also gives a certain sense of integrity to the book. That a book that's shaped this way, well, I have other books that are shaped this way that are meant more for, like, sitting on the coffee table, for guests to peruse, that also have pictures in them, right? Even though, risk I say, this, is, this book is quite academic compared to a book with regards to cats, let's say. <laughs> Which, by the way, I have one of those. A cat, too, that is. <laughs> so, there's the integrity of it. it. It makes more sense when you see, oh, there's pictures in it. and not, It's not just text. So you've got clarity, you've got integrity, and then you have proportion in the sense that, well, does it contain everything it's supposed to contain? And again, because it's a more scholarly book, certainly I wouldn't necessarily be able to answer that question without um, reading it. But since it is talked about, Cath Cath or does talk about Catholic Church architecture and the spirit of the liturgy, Let's say I read the book and it was all about different styles of art and architecture and said nothing about what we do at Mass. Would it be truly complete seeing the title is, contains the spirit of the liturgy? No, it wouldn't be. But if I go through the book and find that everything in this title is reflected in the content of the book, then there's a certain proportion to it, if you would, completeness to it. And in this way, it can be deemed a beautiful book. So you follow that whole kind of three-part thing? So these are, these are three main characteristics that St. Thomas identifies for us, is proportion, integrity, and clarity, or in the Latin, 
consonantia, integritas, and claritas. And all of those things need to be rightly ordered for a thing to be considered beautiful. And what is the end goal of this? And I love this term, and I'll explain what it means. Uh, my professor, Dr. McNamara, would refer to how a thing is beautiful when it most effectively reveals the quote-unquote ontological secret. What's he getting at? Our ontological secret as people of God is fundamentally that we're human beings, but we're also baptized Christians, members of the body of Christ. This is quote-unquote who we are. And so for us then to be beautiful is when that belonging to Jesus Christ truly radiates forth from us in the most proper way. In addition to, of course, that we quote-unquote look normal. <laughs> because if I was standing up here with three arms, let's say, that would be quite ugly, I suppose. But on the other hand, that there is something more than just that outward appearance. There's kind of this revealing of the inner character that's meant to take place. This is part of what we are striving for. So to cut right to the chase, back to our standing out in Twin City suburb A, B, or C and looking at the sign, St. Whoever's Parish, and looking at the building in the background and saying, that doesn't look like a church. All of a sudden, this ontological secret is in a sense being exposed. Where in this case, it's being shown to not being well revealed. Because when we can stand and say, wow, this looks like a beautiful church. That reality of churchness, the perfection in our, in our mind, and for that matter, objectively speaking, in terms of what we're going to get into as to what a church maybe ought to look like. That's what we're tapping into. Does it reveal its inner nature, its inner character, or does it not? Shoot, I think I ate too many pieces of pizza. <laughs> so herein lies the rub. In terms of this beauty being in the eye of the beholder kind of mentality that often exists is whether or not beauty is defined by the perfection of what is being judged or is it in the sentiments of the one who is judging. And for what it's worth, what I've said to you in kind of broad strokes, perhaps a little bit disjointed, but hopefully it'll make more sense when we look at actual uh, case studies, if you would. Um, hopefully you're recognizing that for something to be deemed beautiful isn't simply for me or you or anyone else to sort of be given a sense of pleasure by it individually, where a thing could be beautiful for one and not for another. No, there's something more in terms of does the inner character, does its real nature of what the thing is, is it expressed in a way that is clear, in proper proportion, containing everything it ought to contain? Does it have that integrity of being true to what it really is, etc.? Um, and so is beauty objective or subjective in this context? We're quite definitely talking about an objective reality here and not merely left to each individual subject to determine. Um, so enough on that. Let's look at a couple pictures. So what do we think? Is this, what is this, first of all? What do you think? It's definitely a church. This is St. Mary's Church in Sleepy Eye, Minnesota, if you've ever been down that way. I happened to do a road trip thing a few summers ago and found myself there, and the church happened to be open. So I went in and took a few pictures, including this one. Yes, this is quite a beautiful church, and one of the things I, I like about this kind of a 
putting this church before you as opposed to, say, one of our own local churches here is because this is in a somewhat unknown place to us. So the likelihood of everybody having seen it and taking it for granted is going to be less, perhaps. But I also thought, no, I'm going to use this picture because it's going to help me illustrate another point later on when we get to some of the particular concerns about why we don't or why we can't build things like this anymore. So stay tuned. So it's, I would guess you're all pretty much thinking, yeah, it, it's quite beautiful. It says this is a church. It clearly conveys its churchness to us. Um, it has a sense of capturing something of its inner secret, which is what? To bring us into an encounter with God, an encounter with the reality of heaven, which we're not in heaven yet, but as with all of the liturgy, when we step into the liturgy, we're stepping into a reality where heaven and earth are being drawn together, or at least they're supposed to be. And so, indeed, this, this space has that capacity to raise our hearts to a certain level of recognition that God is here in a very powerful and, for that matter, loving manner. How about this? Some of you may recognize this. I'm not going to say where it's from because these videos are going on the internet after all. So, what is it? This is kind of an interesting point. I hear murmurs. Well, it's a crucifix. Well, it's a statue. Well, it's a... This is erected in a place where you would typically find a crucifix. I was hoping for a wider angle shot, quite honestly, when I pirated this one off the internet today. Um, because beneath it and a little bit in front of it are an altar and a presider's chair and an ambo. So this is basically from a church. And it's, again, erected in a place where you would normally find a crucifix. So your response betrays a certain sense that, no, this is not beautiful. Why? Among other reasons, because you had a hard time identifying what it really is. Whereas if it had been an actual crucifix, mindful that over here, the, the San Damiano crucifix, infamously known in Assisi as the one that spoke to St. Francis and told him to go and rebuild the church, even though it's painted as opposed to sculpted like our crucifix up in the church is, you know that it's a crucifix because it has the cross and it has our, our Lord's body painted upon it. Or this, well, doesn't really evoke quite that same immediate response. So there's something off here. Now, whereas the artist had his reasons for this, certainly I would go on record in saying, as an artist, you can do whatever you want in terms of your art studio, but something like this should never be behind an altar in a church because it doesn't convey the message that the crucifix is meant to convey. But I'm going to leave it there, and maybe someday the pastor and I can confer about this. <laughs> Where's that at? <laughs> Let someone in the audience tell you, because I know, but I'm not going to tell. <laughs> it's the church in Grand Rapids. St. Joseph's in Grand Rapids. So that being what it is, we're going to back it up to here for now because we have, I have a few more things to point out. One is just as simple on, as on your outline as we continue down. Hopefully this evokes a little bit of a, an opportunity for a, a different kind of question. 
given what I've said, albeit in broad strokes, about what true beauty is, who's more beautiful, the saint or the one who's on the cover of the latest fashion magazine? How do you know they're you not want any one and the same? <laughs> a supermodel that is a saint? The saint. <laughs> I mean, is it Keats who said truth is beauty and beauty is truth? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the saint is truth. The model is airbrush. We don't know what's real about her. Okay. That's, that's a good point, actually. Because I also accept these points of, you know, that it could be both in terms of maybe the supermodel is a saint. I mean, we've all seen pictures of Mother Teresa. Isn't she beautiful? Even though by, you know, if at the latest uh, beauty parlor, she'd be a, a shriveled up something or other. Fill in the blank there. Choose your favorite noun. But she's beautiful. Why? Because of who she really is. Not because of just simply what she looks like. Um... And so hopefully that gives you a sense of where these, things, these ideas are coming from. So why ought churches and religious art be beautiful? Because of the point I started to make at the beginning, churches are sacramental in that they are visible signs of what is invisible. Whether we call that invisible reality God himself or probably more better said, the invisible reality invoked by a church building is hopefully the whole realm of the heavenly uh, perfection, might we call it. The sense of God being present, but also in his presence being the angels, the saints. Not that you have to have pictures and statues of angels and saints on every single, you know, open space of wall and floor, no. But from that perspective that hopefully it causes a person to be caught up into that, that reality of what they can't see. And again, revealing something of this quote unquote ontological secret of who God is, of what heaven really is. Um, so again, the churches serve to function in bringing us into communion with God albeit in an earthly encounter. Um, but this takes place when? Primarily through the liturgy. And this is where these realities then kind of come together. Our churches are not merely museums to make us think about God. They are realities that are meant to lead to even deeper encounter through the liturgy itself. And this is where, when it talks about what a church should look like, so to speak, it really is the liturgy that is dictating what the church ought to look like. And it shouldn't be, let's build a church and, you know, this is what we think would look good and, yeah, this will be workable with the liturgy. No, if you're going to build a church the right way, you need to know about the liturgy first and then go about building your church. Um, but then there's also the reality of individual devotion. And this is where St. Ben's will be kind of an interesting case study in its own right, especially with the, the recent uh, upgrades, might we call them, of the, the mural and the, the statuary and so forth. There is a definite kind of pointing towards the altar, and that was always there, risk I say, even in the pre-mural days with the former backdrop, which we'll get into in due time here. But now there's quite a bit more statuary in the church than there was, say, 10 years ago. Um, and some of them are in places that very definitively are meant for individual and private devotion. The little cutout niche where the votive light stand is, where the, uh, the various icons are. Clearly a devotional space, and rightly so. Um, those are important too. But the primary reality is, again, the church building isn't meant to just be all these devotional chapels. It's primarily meant to be a place in, of encounter through the liturgy. Um, 
and kind of going back to earlier principles then the beauty of the church in a sense is enhanced when the liturgy is being celebrated in the right way which is kind of an interesting thing to think of because then we go beyond the church just being museum material let's say and and it really does begin to serve more of its proper purpose when the liturgy is taking place if that makes sense yes george ann I what you're going to talk about, but as you were just talking about the little devotional places, how does that relate to where tabernacles are placed in the church? May I come back to that one? Yeah. Because that, that's getting into a little bit more, shall we say, theological distinctions and things that I'll probably cover more at the end when we talk about some of the particular issues. So remind me to talk about tabernacle placement. Um, and so I guess from that point we can kind of maybe wrap up what I've been saying the liturgy will hopefully enhance and bring out the deeper beauty of the church building simply by its being celebrated okay make sense mm -hmm. I do have some more slides but this one I'm just going to show you as more of a this is really cool and in fact, I think, I can't remember who it was, but one of the, it, it may have been one of the Ivy League schools out in our East Coast there, or New England area, that helped the Vatican to pull this off. But they have this thing where you can go on a virtual tour of the, of the four major basilicas as well as a few other things. So if I just click on San Pietro, this is the Italian part of it, but... There is an English section, so here we go, English. So you've got this <coughs> opportunity to see different points of view of the, of the church. Let's go, let's look at, um, let's do the PA talk, because we're gonna look at the, at the apps and the nave a little bit later, actually, as part of something I'm going to, as much as I know how we love chant here, I'll, I'll cut the sound transmission for you too. So, so yeah, and then with your cursor you can turn and you can zoom in. So there's Michelangelo's masterpiece, Pieta, with Our Lady holding Our Lord at the crucifixion scene after he's taken from the cross, etc. And this, when you go into St. Peter's Basilica, it's, it's immediately on your right. So it's right by the, the main doors. So then if you wanted to spin all the way around without getting dizzy, Father. <laughs> all right. No, wrong way. So there's your... Ah! <laughs> Glad I don't drive this way. Maybe I do. I shouldn't ask that, say that. <laughs> Directly across then is where the, the baptistry is. Let's zoom it out, yeah. So over here is the baptistry, but then you can look down this side aisle and the main body of the church is out here, etc. And the altar way up would be to the right. So this is a cool little thing they've got on the Vatican website. And, and when you go to it, you just scroll down to the bottom and it has basically words to the effect of basilicas and papal chapels, virtual tours. Mm -hmm. So if you went into their main homepage, you'd scroll down to the bottom and you could find this kind of on the lower right side of the page. Here we are. I don't know what year this was, but Sister dredged this up for my benefit. Um, we're not quite there yet, so we're going to go back to this page. Um, let me just say a few things, because honestly, this is the more boring part of the night, in my opinion, even though I've, I'm seeing I'm challenged to keep some of your eyes open after all that pizza. Um, <laughs> but it's important to know that Vatican II addressed what 
church art architecture should look like. Again, the church has a very high and noble place for art and artists. And so in the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, they do devote multiple paragraphs to these matters, saying, among other things, that the arts are meant to show the infinite beauty of God, and thus works are to be beautiful. Works of art are to be beautiful. Okay, I missed a word there. Um, and the principles for such beauty should include that the church is open to styles from all places and times. So keep that in mind. As we talk about these things, there's no one style of art that the church has sort of said, everything needs to be classical or everything needs to be Renaissance or Gothic or thanks be to God, they haven't said everything needs to be modern. Um, but there, there's openness to all of these insofar as they have that ability to communicate this deeper ontological secret, this deeper reality of, that is hidden. Um, they're to be suit, churches are to be suitable for the celebration of liturgical service and for the active participation of the faithful without expressing anything repugnant to the faith. I love that they use that word. That's almost as good as Pope Francis using sourpuss in his uh, encyclical. Um, so nothing repugnant to the faith can be part of our, our artwork, our architectural uh, design, etc. Images should be placed in church buildings with a proper ordering. So this goes back to, again, what I was alluding to already, that the liturgy having the primary place those realities that are meant for the liturgy need to have that primacy where devotional art needs to be properly set so that it's conducive to the personal and private devotions of the faithful, but not detracting from their liturgical prayer. So this is why typically you don't put devotional statues and paintings right behind your altar, let's say. You know, as I was saying to someone earlier tonight, the, the choices for the mural with the, uh, the resurrection scene, the crucifixion scene, and the Last Supper scene, these, in a very real way, are liturgical artworks. Whereas, had there been a choice, well, let's put St. Benedict in Subiaco in one panel and St. Anthony in Padua in another panel, that would not have worked because those are devotional images more related to their, their piety, their way of life, etc. Um, paragraphs 126 to 127 speaks regarding persons involved in art and architecture, again, wanting to encourage them. Um, and then 128 simply calls for revisions of laws regarding these matters, mindful of the building itself and the furnishings necessary for the liturgy. But keep in mind, as I said on the what did Vatican II really say night, that you don't read this stuff in a vacuum from Vatican II as though, oh, Vatican II said that things should be nobly simple. Noble simplicity kind of became another set of buzzwords here in the 20th century. So that means we should start ripping out uh, sacred art and painting over frescoes and sadly that has happened in far too many places but once again that's not how we should have ever read Vatican II and now 50 years removed hopefully we won't ever read it again that way we read things in continuity mindful of what was good and how Vatican II was simply giving clarification and hopefully making things better. So, so now a fun question. Why are there so many ugly churches? Risk, I say, in a single word, modernism. And that goes right back to when philosopher Descartes said, I think, therefore I am making himself the arbiter of reality. And this 
modern mentality mm -hmm. about, you know, I am the arbiter of my own sense of reality, and accordingly, what's beautiful and meaningful and helpful to me, it's no wonder that things have taken on this tone. And I've referenced one document here, Environment and Art in Catholic Worship, from 1978. Sadly, this is Modernism 101, this document. A little bit of the backstory on art and environment in Catholic worship is that it's, because it's a U.S. bishop's document, it doesn't hold the weight, same weight that a Holy See document does. But tell that to some of those who have built churches since 1978. Um, Another issue with this document, whereas, and fittingly enough, our bishops are having their general assembly right now in Washington, D.C., and likely they had to do, take deliberate action on one thing or another. I don't even know what was on the docket for their meeting this week, necessarily. Um, but typically, things there work through committees, and once the committee has a draft of something, it goes to the full body of the bishops, at least stuff of this kind of magnitude do. Well, art and environment in Catholic worship was subjected to no such thing. It was a committee job, and it basically kind of just sort of was pushed right through without the whole body of the bishops being able to give their point of view on it. And if that were not enough, a lot of the principles in this document don't even come from Catholic theology. They come from an, a, a Lutheran architect at Augsburg University in uh, the Twin Cities. So, if you've ever been to the church that looks like the big shoe box where all of the, mer the furniture is movable, that's example or exhibit number one for this document, because that was a theology that was pushed, is that the church is not the building, it's the people. And when we come together, we come together to encounter each other before the Lord. And when we come together, we shouldn't be tied down to rigid structures, mindful that you know our situation is changing, etc. So you had churches built that are basically, you know, they could double as basketball gymnasiums so long as the basketball baskets are put up on each end. And all of the furniture on the floor, well, I think this year for Advent, we're going to put the altar over here. But then at, uh, once Christmas comes, we're going to move it to this side. And all the chairs. Well, let's do the chairs in a semicircle for Advent, but then at Christmas, let's do the chairs all the way around the whole altar. I mean, that's the kind of mentality that was at work here. Um, enough about that. If anything, it gives you answer to where some of this came from. Now, they tried to right the ship in 2000 with their more recent statement on art and architecture, built of living stones. And this one is certainly much better, and it leaves some latitude for different types of expressions, which is also good, um, but by no means does it necessarily correct everything of, of the 1978 document. So, and, and part of the problem is too, I mean, we're, even a lot of good Catholic architects don't necessarily know things that I'm telling you this evening. They weren't taught that in any of their architectural history courses, let's say. So they're doing the best they can. But I will say on the flip side, and this probably isn't going to come into play for us maybe in any of our lifetimes, but if you know people who are living in parishes that are in a situation where they need to build a new church building or they need to build their first church building because they don't have one yet and the bishop just started their parish in recent years and they're working out of a, you know, a, a city, uh, city hall, let's say, for their Sunday masses, which happens, there are really good architects in our country, and they're not that difficult to find. It's just part of the problem is they're not around here. One of them is in Notre Dame. Another is out in Washington, D.C. 
So there are some good, solidly rooted Catholic art architects now, and hopefully we're going to kind of be rescued from churches that look more like pizza huts than churches. Um, but that being said, let's have the real fun for tonight. The reason you all came, well, maybe not. So here we are, and again, I don't know what years this is from. I don't know if anyone can make out who that is behind the altar there and say, oh, that's Father so-and-so. He was here from 19 this to 19 that. Um, but albeit, many of you recognize this as what was for many years. And here's a close-up of the altar and a couple things I'll point out. You've got your very prominent altar. You've got your steps that, which you can't really make it out from this angle, but certainly I'm guessing everyone here knows how the steps are more like an island where the top step is separated from the back wall as opposed to the top step being all the way butted up to the back wall. Um, you have the, the screen here, which affectionately known, I realize, as sewer pipes by many. Um, and this is where the fun, in a sense, begins. And of course, the, the current, this picture snapped at around 4.30 this afternoon. Um, so what is it about St. Ben's that has had me kind of salivating over to this night and saying, wait till they find out the thought that was put into this church. But before I go to, into any of my things, I have some questions for some of you. Does, is anyone aware of who designed the church and more so maybe where they were from? Because I have a theory. My theory is maybe they had something to do with St. John's in Collegeville. Oh, that makes sense. Because certainly one of the case studies for some of the things I'm going to point out about St. Ben's are things that also exist at the Abbey at uh, St. John's. And the fact, too, that to my knowledge, there's no other church like this in our diocese. There's certain churches that have certain common features, shall we say, or patterns, but they're not as well thought out as this church. So, and, and that's what sort of says, I bet Collegeville had something to do with St. Benedict's Parish being what it is, built in 1960 as it is. And that's your first hint. 1960, had Vatican II happened yet? No. no. Was Vatican II in people's awareness? Yes. Pope John XXIII had already announced the council by 1960, but it certainly nothing had come to pass just yet. But what you did have at work was about 50 years, well, maybe more fairly, about 80 years of a reality formally called the liturgical movement that I've referenced in other evenings. Um, the liturgical movement being a, an effort to help people enter more deeply into the liturgy through quote-unquote active participation. And with that, certain ideas as to church arrangement that were already in play. So, and I think I need to go to the next slide for this. So here's our Here's our step pattern, more visibly pointed out in terms of this top platform being the top platform and not the same height as what is adjoined to the wall there. One of the things of the liturgical movement was the fact that the church, for its part, needs to be more simple so that the liturgical life and elements essential to the liturgy can show forth more clearly. So rather than a, a Gothic or Romanesque kind of reredos, as they're often called, the big, like at St. Mary Star of the Sea, the big pointy altar that's behind the, the altar, 
Rather than that, no, just a more simple backdrop. But in addition to that simple backdrop, why not a freestanding altar? And mind you, and I, I probably should have said this on the Vatican II night, there were those before Vatican II even pushing for the priest to face the people. So just to be clear about that, that that did exist before Vatican II, at least in the minds of some, that this would be a good idea. But even so, those who were all about ad orientum worship had two things in mind. One is that if the altar isn't against the back wall, it's going to be closer to the people, thus in that way helping to facilitate active participation. And so here you are in 1960. Everything is still ad orientum in 1960, but you already have a freestanding altar here. The second reason being, and those who are devotees of the 1962 Mass, I guess I'd be curious to know what your celebrants of that Mass who have celebrated here did about this when they did the High Mass. Did they go to the right with the incense and then to the left and then come back to the middle? Or did they go all the way around in their incensing? Because this was another thought, was by pulling the altar out, when Father incenses at the high mass, he can go all the way around the whole circumference of the altar and not just to the right and then to the left. So you've got the freestanding altar piece. You've got the reality of... I keep looking at the wrong part of my notes here. There we go. Um, the altar itself, it's big. It's very prominent. And it's certainly something that being made out of stone as opposed to wood or some other material kind of commands a certain uh, primacy in its own right. So the altar it is certainly a feature the fan-shaped uh, kind of layout of the whole nave of the building. Why? Bringing people closer to the altar. Even though I joked with a few people that maybe I could get you to believe that they did that because so many people like to sit in the back. They just created more back pews. <laughs> no, that's not why they did that. It was to get the people closer to the altar versus the more traditional shall we say, straight line, uh, basilica style uh, building, which again still has a rightful place, the basilica style building, and there's reasons for that which I chose not to go into tonight. Um, then there's this fun little tidbit. We all know why the, the screen with the so-called sewer pipes is there, because we know what was intended to be behind that. And it's, if, if you don't, just go up these steps and go to the door that takes you behind the altar and read the plaque on the door. What's it say? Choir room. That was intentional. The choir would be back there providing their talent, as it were, being able to enter into the liturgy more, albeit even though they couldn't necessarily see it because of the... Uh, non-transparent, I don't even know if it's cloth or what it is that's on that back side there. Or, or that wasn't there at the time. No? no? It was open. So, so you could see through it? Yeah. Okay. So all the more credibility to, again, that, that reality of the choir being close to the altar so that they could be heard, but still obstructed enough where they wouldn't become a reality unto themselves. And then, finally, the large crucifix. This was something that, in my last-ditch reading to get ready for tonight, came through and through of those who have written about this time period, is rather than the crucifix being small and the tabernacle being a crucifix stand, which in a lot of churches that have the big reredos, that's what you see, is you have the tabernacle and then the crucifix right on top of it, which is blending in with all these little Gothic spikes or Romanesque ar arches, etc., and not so discernible. No, boo, in your face, there's the crucifix. Why? Because the Mass is a sacrifice. And this one might be a little more of a stretch, um, 
but I tend to think that the opening above the altar up to the where we get the natural light coming in is also meant to be kind of reminiscent in a sense of how some of the churches have these canopies over the altar. If you've been in Blessed Sacrament in Hibbing, if you've been at the St. Paul Cathedral, there's a certain sense of, you know, kind of that upward moment, movement there, but also kind of drawing more focus to the altar itself again. And like I say, that one's a little more of a stretch, but I would bank on any of these other things I've pointed out as being very timely, in a certain sense, very cutting edge. So who knew that you were in a cutting edge parish? <laughs> Actually, I think a lot of people know that. Um, so hopefully that is something you didn't know before about your, your church building, which I have to admit, having uh, my first real look at your church building was when Father Rich became the pastor, and I was coming here regularly to conduct a young adult group with him back in 2001, 2002. Um, but then I went and got this education, and as we were learning this, I'm like, that's St. Benedict's in Duluth. <laughs> so for all this time, it's, this has been stuff that's been like, ooh, I can't wait to share this. <laughs> Because it, it really is kind of, I'd say, kind of cool that yeah. among all of the churches in Duluth, some of which have their own story to tell in their own way, certainly there's a real story to tell here, too. So now then, some particular issues. Let's see, is that my last slide? No, that one is. Okay. We'll look at this the rest of the time then. Um, Common objections might I bring up. We should not build ornate churches anymore because, well, there's this one, which I didn't put in my notes even. There's the objection, we shouldn't do that because we can't. There's no artists who can build those things anymore. Well, truth is, that's false. There's some beautiful things happening. If you've ever had a chance to or if you ever find yourself in Sioux Falls, it's worth the trip over to their cathedral. Awesome. And they have a, a, a uh, perpetual adoration chapel that is absolutely gorgeous. So, and I mean, that perpetual adoration chapel was done around 2000, I believe. So it's relatively new, but it's, it's spectacular. It's not a very big space. I think there's more room in this open area here than in their Adoration Chapel, but just it's very well thought out and very directed towards the, the Eucharistic devotion that takes place in that space. Um, beautiful things can happen nowadays. Um, there's the, that I already alluded to, the church is the people, not the building. We have to be careful not to become modernists in our own right, because that's very much a modernist either-or kind of mentality. And we as Catholics think in both ends. Yes, the church is the people, but the church is also the building. So it's, it's definitely a both and. We should do more for the poor. Legitimate concern. And no, I'm not going to appeal to Jesus's the poor you always have with you, because that's a different context. He's talking about in reference to himself. But what I am going to say, are not our church buildings also for the poor? It's not just for us who think we have a place here. It's for the poor, too. It's for everybody. So they can be raised up to God in the same way that you and I are, simply by their, their presence among us or their own kind of personal intent to come and spend time in a church. So we have to keep that in mind, that beautiful church buildings are for everyone, including the poor. And here's my ulterior motive, too, of why I chose St. Mary's Sleepy Eye as Exhibit A of a beautiful church and not, say, St. Mary's Star of the Sea in downtown Duluth. I don't know this for sure, but I would guess that it was commoners, farmers, that were responsible for building St. Mary's and Sleepy Eye and not people that were professionals and corporate owners, etc. 
And I think that says something about where people were, say, around 1900. And I don't know how old St. Mary's and Sleepy Eye is, but a good guess is that it was probably built in the first you know, quarter of the 20th century. Who built that? These farmers who were basically devoted to our Lord, trusted our Lord that he would provide for them, and if anything, were giving back to him. And I think that's a lesson that's worth some praying about and reflecting upon, especially when I saw the talking heads on a news channel at the time of the Holy Father's visit to our country going back and forth over who should get the good seats at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York when the Pope comes. Well, don't they realize they would have never done those renovations had it not been for these important people? It's like, okay, that's definitely where American society is today. But I couldn't, my knee-jerk reaction was, clearly these people have East Coast bias and don't recognize that in our own Midwest here, and St. Mary's Sleepy Eye is not a single example. My mother is from a farming community outside of Little Falls. You go down that way, beautiful churches in every one of these little farm towns. There's, there was a spirit of real faith there when these places were built. And so indeed, to the next objection, it's a waste of money and resources. Well, tell that to some of our grandparents and great-grandparents who were so devoted to our Lord. Um, church buildings need to be practical ahead of being beautiful. There again, it's a both and. Um, and then finally, and this one's a little bit different direction, are these concerns simply a matter of decorating? You know, or does layout and construction have any part of the discussion? And clearly, again, any church building project should be a prayer process. And today there are those, including my instructor, who do what they call liturgical consulting. And they, for their part, some are better than others, risk I say. Um, but they can help in a discernment process because one of the neat things about this realm too is that there's not just one model that needs to be copied everywhere. Something of that community's story can and truly ought to be brought into a new church building. Something of what is truly valuable and precious ought to be brought into that community's sense of what will lead us to an encounter with God, etc. And so whereas in Italy, where marble is, you know, seems like they could probably dig a hole in the ground a couple feet deep and they're going to run into a marble deposit or whatever, however they refer to it, you know, we don't have that kind of material here. So do our churches have to have marble in them the way they do in Europe? No. But hopefully we would have more precious materials than just a stick building etc. Um, and then I have this little comment about the churches, how is it oriented? And this is where my next exhibit actually comes into play. Is from the point of view that, again, you know, it's an encounter with God, it's an encounter with heaven, so there needs to be that vertical orientation in the sense of we're not just gathering around each other. We're there to encounter the Lord. Um, and then, of course, there is the, the odd orientum, people look east. This is, this is the, uh, the apse of St. Peter's. This altar is called the altar of the chair because you got this big chair monument that Bernini sculpted in honor of St. Peter and Peter's chair, etc., so I'm going to do a 180 for us. And so we're looking back at the, uh, the papal altar. Recognize this area, Deacon John? You spent a few hours there when your son was ordained a deacon. This is the part of the basilica where the men who go to Rome for their training get ordained deacons, typically. Um, 
But what I'm wanting to point out is here, these windows, this is the front entrance of the basilica. This is actually the literal east-facing direction in St. Peter's. So when the Pope celebrates Mass, he's already looking east, even though he's, quote-unquote, facing the people. But here's what used to happen. Is let's say I'm in that other part of the basilica. So I'm looking at the papal altar. The Eucharistic prayer comes. I turn around and he's behind me. And we're all looking east together. And so that's another little twist to some of the ad orientum theology here is that there was precedent that in buildings where the orientation was towards the east, everyone would literally turn to the east. So for us, that would probably be something like this. Um, because not every building could be built mindful of literal, literal east, you have the liturgical east, which is what we exercise here. But that's just another tidbit, is that some buildings were deliberately planned so that the front entrance, when you were standing on the front steps looking out, you'd be facing west because you'd want to be going east as you were going into church and towards the altar. But are you saying, I'm confused here over time. So you're saying right now we're looking east, but that's not really. Yes. That's not that, really going into the altar, right? Isn't the main altar this way? Or we're we're behind. Way? We're behind the main altar now. Right. So the main the main altar. This where the arrow is, the cursor. That's that's the side that the pope stands on to offer mass when he offers mass at that altar, at that but altar. it's facing literal east. And I'm saying that people who would have been on that opposite side from where we're standing would have also turned to the east, and the Pope would have been at their back. But the chair, in this view, that's it, looking towards the opening. Those are the main doors there, right? Yeah. That isn't the main altar. So this, this, this is the, this is the, the west-facing side. This is not the main altar here. Okay. Okay. The main altar, the papal altar, rather, as it's more properly deemed, is this one under the okay. big ball, the, the big canopy, directly under the dome. The dome okay. is straight up okay. from here. Thank you. So let's talk about some of these issues then. Of where do things go? Where does the tabernacle go? Some of that has been subject to different circumstances in history, let's say. For a long time, the tabernacle was directly on the altar. And of course, those were the altars that were up against the wall. So you had the tabernacle and priest and then everything behind him in terms of the nave. But then, with the uh, Novus Ordo Mass, it's pretty plain that the tabernacle should not be on the altar where the Mass is celebrated. And so, Tabernacles were shifted off of the altar, or for that matter, with the freestanding altar, they were still there. It's just it was never on that same altar where the Mass was being offered from. But then different things came into play, some which was well-founded, such as, well, the tabernacle, because our focus during the liturgy should be not on the tabernacle, but on the altar, it's okay for the tabernacle to be away from the altar in a place that's more suitable for private prayer. Now, I personally take issue with some of the condescending nature of what I'm about to say. There were those who said, we wouldn't want the tabernacle to be a distraction during Mass. So it's better to move it to a place away from the main altar. And I, and I say that's condescending in my opinion because... It, it basically says, well, the people can't be taught that during Mass we're not concerned about the tabernacle per se. We're conscious it's there, but our focus needs to be on the altar. See, wasn't that an easy lesson? <laughs> but yet, no, we need, to, we need to move the tabernacle because we don't want people to be distracted by it. Please. 
But that sort of one thing leading to another, meritorious would be that the tabernacle should be in a place that's suitable for prayer. Great. So the in St. Peter's, where's the tabernacle? It's actually from this point of view, I'm working backwards, I can't do that. It's up about halfway and over on this side in the side chapel is where the Eucharistic chapel is. So it's nowhere near the papal altar, it's nowhere near this other back altar that I started out pointing you towards here. It's way over here on the side. But here's the thing, that Eucharistic chapel is very much set aside where you don't have pilgrims, whether they're prayerful or simply there to look at what they think is nothing more than a museum and anything in between. You don't have people coming through interrupting you as you try to pray. And here's the other part to that. Is it a noteworthy space? Yes, it's actually quite a nice space. It's, it's pretty, as things go in St. Peter's Basilica, it's not a very big chapel, but as things go in typical American parishes, it's bigger than some churches. I bet, I bet the Eucharistic Chapel at St. Peter's is maybe just a little bit smaller than our church. So it's a big space. There's plenty of room in there, and it's, it's a nice place to go and pray. And can people find it? Yes, people can find it. And this has been one of the struggles in our country, is that while there's good intention besides having a set-aside space for, for people to be able to pray before the Blessed Sacrament, unfortunately, and I say this in jest, mind you, even though it's a little, it has quite a bit of a tinge of cynicism, is I've often reflected that I think they want people to have a Mary Magdalene moment. They've taken my Lord and I don't know where they put him. <laughs> some, of the, some of the places that have been established as Eucharistic chapels are frankly about as nice as this first uh, uh, temporary room on the left in terms of decoration and in terms of layout and the tabernacles just shoved in a corner and frankly the Lord knows and we pray for mercy <laughs> but on the other hand thankfully more recent le legislation including this other US bishops document built of living stones is a little more clear that the tabernacle needs to be in a place that's quote unquote conspicuous very notable very easy to find when uh, during the time of Archbishop Schnur as our bishop he made it known quite openly seeing there was for a diocese of our size a good amount of building and renovating going on in his time as our bishop he made it known that any uh, sanctuary renovations will mean that the tabernacle is going back behind the altar so he, he did put his kind of stamp on that because he recognized in so many words what I said about you can be taught that during mass you should be focusing on the altar and not the tabernacle. Um, but also he recognized that we don't have any churches in this diocese that have an overabundance of pilgrim traffic to the point where the, where the tabernacle needs to be in a side chapel away from all of the pilgrims coming to and fro. I mean, and I, I know that sounds kind of cynical in its own right, but it's true. Our churches are small, and there's no reason, even in our cathedral, that the tabernacle can't be right behind the altar and still be in a suitable place for prayer. So, I hope that answers your question. Are there other questions, reactions? So, you mentioned that Bishop, uh, Archbishop Schnur made the correction to that abuse. Um, uh, for other abuses, whether it's uh, architectural or, or, or you know, whatever it may be, who is responsible to correct the abuses? Well, technically it, it's... 
it resides in the bishop to be able to ensure the worthy or the not worthy per se, that's not the right word, the, the proper celebration of the sacred mysteries on behalf of the people. Because by the way, the people have a right to the liturgy being celebrated the right way. Um, and if it's not being the celebrated the right way and you take issue with it, what's your chain of command? Your chain of command should first be to speak directly to the pastor and if he won't listen to you, then you speak to those at the diocesan level, which would be me in terms of my liturgy department responsibilities. And frankly, I could take things to the bishop if I needed to, in terms of bishop, here's what's going on. Are you aware of this? And then if he needs to, to verbalize something, or if he says, well, why don't you correct that for me, Father? <laughs> then I'm the one that gets to have the, whether it's the letter or the phone conversation or the can I come out and visit you sometime kind of thing. Thankfully, I haven't been subjected to a lot of that because I don't think I have the gumption for it just yet, seeing that I'm kind of a wimp on some of that stuff. Um, but if, if even the bishop doesn't listen, then you can take it all the way to the Holy See but it should follow that progression. And realize the priest at the parish not listening versus the priest simply blowing you off are not necessarily the same thing. And if he blows you off, then you definitely want to take it to the next level. But if he doesn't listen to you, it's, he may not necessarily listen to the next one up either, unfortunately. Human nature. Pray for us. What are your thoughts on like churches that have a separate area where they do the daily mass that's not in the actual place where they do that? That can be okay. There are those who um, have done that simply out of just seeing to it that the daily mass might be celebrated in a more, shall we say, I don't want to say proper, because it's not about being proper, but for those who are there to more effectively participate, rather than someone out in left field and someone in the next ballpark and that kind of thing in some of the big churches. Um, yeah, a daily mass chapel, in fact, I can think of one parish where they they deliberately built a daily mass chapel in their new building, and it's actually it's quite nice in terms of size. It's it's sufficient for their needs. I think it seats about 60 to 80 people, um, but then they don't need to be in their big church, which seats more like 800, you know, for weekday masses with those in the back row and those in the third row and those over in the side section. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the after-the-fact story, I have to admit. But for those who are interested, here's my, my uh, shall we say, lineage. Um, Dr. McNamara at the Liturgical Institute. Um, I had Cassie, because of my just having it sent to my diocesan office here and receiving it a week ago. Uh, the folks at the Liturgical Institute are doing this neat little thing about the Mass where they're little two to three minute long clips each week to teach people about Mass. And they're issued, they apparently do a new video and they, they upload it every Sunday and people can sign up for an email notification that a new video is up. Um, on our website, there actually is, if you scroll down a little way, a link already in place to the Liturgical Institute. But if you did the liturgicalinstitute.org and then went to their video tab and category, or, or, or videos category, or whatever, however that's worded, sorry about that. Um, it'll take you to this page, and actually if you click on the link to YouTube within the video itself, it'll take you to their YouTube channel. 
where all of them are right there in order. So. In my work as a teacher and as a person so, who anyway, works with architects, it helps pair. So yeah, a 10 part series on matters that I've covered with you in probably a very insufficient and inadequate manner compared to what he can say. Which is now Catholic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the diocese of Orange in suburban LA bought the Crystal Cathedral and is transforming it, or may have by now transformed it into their cathedral, because they were a diocese without a cathedral for all of their history up till now, from what I understand. I'll go on record and say that sounds like something Father Rich would say. <laughs> no, that be it is quite possible that someone said that because those steps are not necessarily the most user friendly. I mean, you got to be careful. And I mean, I, I teach people and I'll have to teach altar servers or make sure our altar server trainers teach that one of the Ten Commandments of serving on the altar is you never walk backwards. And around here, there's good reasons for that. In addition to by walking backwards, say at even the cathedral, you might run into somebody or something. So as long as you're diligent about where you're at and one of my other sort of dictums of liturgical service on the altar is we take our time and we're not in a hurry. And so as long as we're watching what we're doing, it doesn't need to be an issue. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit narrow up there. I found myself the first two, three weeks doing my genuflection at the, after the consecration with my foot hanging off the step and kind of going, oh, bring it back in, Father. You can't go out that far when you genuflect. So it's, it's pretty narrow up there. And the steps themselves are, I think they're wide enough, but it's just because they're, they're not what you are used to going up and down, seeing they have the curvature to them. You gotta, you gotta be diligent. But on the other hand too, and this is separate from any of the, the features I pointed out, but the fact that there are three steps as opposed to two steps or five steps also has kind of a theological significance behind it in its own right. So it wouldn't necessarily be a, an easy decision for one who knows what they're doing to modify those steps without perhaps doing some damage to the integrity of the intent behind it. Well, I hope you had as much fun as I did. I know it started a little slow with the, all that philosophy and that, but um, that was the groundwork that had to be put in place. And so hopefully it makes more sense of why we build the way we do and can we still build nice churches? Absolutely. Do they cost money? Yes. But risk I say even pizza huts and gymnasium churches cost money too. And it's all a matter of where our hearts are. Um, so. Certainly nice things can be done, and the aforementioned parish, I didn't mention a name when asked about daily mass chapels, but I was speaking of Immaculate Heart in Cross Lake. New church, um, they, they took the time to really think about it. Their architect was at a disadvantage, being very much a modernist, not necessarily by choice, because most schools of architecture, that's what they teach them. So they've got to do some retro work just to know why Catholic churches can't be Morton buildings or et cetera, or you know, barns. 
but we, we, the, there's groundwork in place. Like I mentioned, there's good architects around, and for what it's worth, anyone who aspires to be an architect and wants a, a more well kind of liberal arts approach to architecture as opposed to a modernist approach, the University of Notre Dame um, has an awesome architecture program. So put that out there for anyone who cares. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, and let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Father in heaven, we desire to encounter you more deeply each and every day, and we pray that in our own praying of the Mass, the very setting within which we pray the Mass, and indeed, and especially by your grace itself, that that encounter might be brought to fulfillment that we might be drawn closer to you in this life and in particular be ready for the eternal liturgy and communion that is your kingdom through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Any more pizza?